Welcome to our second session of the day for Hacer's 2023 Executive Programs. We hope you enjoyed your evening and are ready for a day filled with insights, networking, and an evening celebration of the 2023 class of the Hacer Young Hispanic Corporate Achievers. To start off the day, please welcome to the stage the moderator for our first session, Creating a Lasting Legacy, Hacer's Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer, Silvia Perez Cash. <laughs> okay, we really have to do better. Where is everyone? <laughs> we need them to come in from the breakfast. I'm very tempted to wait for them. I know my team would not appreciate that if they're on schedule. But for those who are here on time, buenos dias, mi gente, a todos, gracias por estar aquí. <laughs> you know? um, we have a really significant day ahead of us. And this is one, it's our final day, it's hard to believe, our final day of the conference, but it's gonna be a big one. Yesterday was all about stepping into the C-suite. Today's conversations will delve into leadership as a corporate board director. Yesterday, we talked about our shared experiences of leadership. Today, we will lift up the Latina-specific experience in a male-dominated sector. And then yesterday, we heard insights from corporate CEOs of the present. And tonight, we will recognize and celebrate our corporate CEOs of the future, our newest cohort of our, of our Hacer Young Hispanic Corporate Achievers. I don't know about you, but when I think of all the connections between those conversations, all the thoughts we've shared on stage, the conversations in our cafecito breaks between everybody here in the room, all the individual experiences that we use this dedicated space to share with each other, these experiences that demonstrate the audacity and the power of Hispanic inclusion at the top tiers of corporate leadership. When I think of all of that, I am only inspired. It's what gets us through these days. It's what has me waking up at five in the morning so I can be here with you. It's nothing but inspirational. I also wanna give a special shout out to our social media posters in the room. Anybody wanna raise their hands? Who's been posting? Yes, yes, good. You help us share the value of our community, the centered design that our, these conferences offer and the impact of Latinx inclusion at all levels of leadership including the very top. So please continue to post about our executive programs conference. And when you do, tag us, of course, using our official hashtag, HaserEP23. Welcome, come on in, come to the front. You know, we got you, there's lots of space. Um, now, it is my pleasure to introduce a representative from our business session sponsor, Liberty Mutual. Please help me welcome to the stage Liberty Mutual's Assistant Director of Strategic Partnerships Leader, Magali Munoz Mejorado. Good morning, how's everyone doing? Yeah, the energy? <laughs> I'm Magali Munoz Mejorado, DEI Strategic Partnerships Leader at Liberty Mutual, and I'm so happy to be here today. The heart of the work we do at Liberty is to strengthen diversity, equity, and inclusion for all people. DEI is at the forefront of our culture. We believe that recognizing, appreciating, and applying the unique insights, perspectives, and backgrounds of each person cultivates an atmosphere of trust and respect. It's also key to our success in engaging with all people and all possibilities. We're proud to partner with organizations like HACER that are creating those opportunities for the advancement of Latinos in corporate America. According to the Pew Research Center, the U.S. Hispanic population reached more than 62 million in 2021. That's 62 million legacies in the making and counting. And I say counting because we're having babies more and more, right? <laughs> Latinas, Latinos. The Young Hispanic Corporate Achievers Program, for example, 
is one of HACER's program focused on teaching the next generation where we come from, tools to advance, and my all-time favorite, networking. In 2015, I had the privilege of forming part of this prestigious group where we heard from Latino leaders in our community their stories of resilience and paying it forward. After being in a room full of about 60 like-minded individuals with the same culture, I remember feeling inspired and excited to continue forging my own path. At Liberty, I find that same sense of community where I can continue to develop. Our Amigos at Liberty and Allies Employee Resource Group is dedicated to, to the same uh, community, and we have over 3,400 members. It serves as a resource to connect, support, and develop Liberty Mutual's Latino community. It's another example of how Liberty is fostering an environment that allows both professional and personal success to flourish. Today, I'm happy to be joined by five of my colleagues, many who are leaders within the Amigos ERG and live all over the country. The other day was the first time we were having dinner as a group, and I'm just always intrigued by how quickly we connect on family, community, and during the conversation, we start talking always about mentorship and who's sponsored you, and the notion of paying it forward came up time and time again. Because as Latinos, we are brought up with a commitment to give back to our communities and lend support to one another when needed. We say, donde come uno, come cinco, diez, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Where one eats, many can too, right? It's these dichos that I believe guide us in our legacy. I want to thank the entire Hacer team for all their hard work in putting these events together because they unite us and make us stronger. And now, I'm excited to continue learning, like you all, to hear from two amazing leaders and their journey to making an impact in our communities. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the session. Thank you, Magali, and thank you, Liberty Mutual, for, all, for your commitment to Hispanic inclusion. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our next panel discussion, Creating a Lasting Legacy. We're going to have a candid and passionate discussion with two amazing leaders who, whose accomplishments in corporate America and the corporate sector encompass not only the value add they brought directly to their respective lines of business, but also the tools, platforms, and relationships they left behind that have empowered the Latinx communities beyond the scope of their direct spheres of influence. I'd love for our panelists to join me on the stage and I'll introduce them together. Hi, Ed. Bien, gracias, Eduardo. Mi alma. Hi, Sylvia. Mm. Please sit down. Okay. Wow, it's a bright light. <gasps> Ooh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So these two amazing leaders have made an enduring impact through their example and their actions. I'd first like to introduce Alma, a soon to be retired, congratulations, <laughs> <laughs> director for corporate diversity and the global ERG network for General Motors. Over more than 35 years of leadership at GM, she's worked to establish relationships with key advocacy groups and consult across various GM functions to achieve diversity and equity. Thank you, Alma, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Next, I'll introduce Eduardo. He's the retired president of the UPS Foundation, where he led global citizenship programs and initiatives. He also served as UPS Chief Diversity Inclusion Officer, advancing the company's inclusion programs for more than half a million UPS employees, suppliers, customers, and communities worldwide. Please give a warm applause for Eduardo Martinez. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm excited to share that we're going to do this session slightly differently because I couldn't say no to these amazing people. <laughs> they want to know exactly, they want to respond to what you want to know from the very beginning. So I'm going to invite you all to 
integrate your questions into the session as we go along. There will be no dedicated Q&A at the end. To accomplish this grand feat of coordination, <laughs> right, we have these two speaker, the microphones in the middle. I'll ask that you just come up when you have your question. Make sure it's an actual question, not a comment, please. Um, and then we'll offer you, we'll give you the space to speak your mind, to address us, this group, um, directly. I'll be taking your questions as you think of them, so please don't be shy, all right? And then after you ask your question, feel free to sit down. You don't need to stand up so we can make room for the next questionnaire. Wonderful. So I'll get us all started, but as I said, don't be shy. So we had a really great discussion when we were thinking about this panel. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I want to start this group of conversation is, is the reflection of when. When does this concept of legacy even enter your mind, right? And you, after all of these years and all this impact that you've had, was it something that you started your career with? Or is it something that came later? When did this vision start? I'll go ahead and start, yeah. if you don't mind. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> Excellent. So it's an interesting <clears throat> question, because um, I actually started my career very young. I was 18 years old. I went to a school called Kettering. And um, I grew up very humble. My mom and dad were not educated. Um, so they really encouraged me to want to work with your mind and not your hands. Mija, you know, quieres trabajar con la mente, no con las manos, right? And so my initial vision was, I need an education. I need a degree. And it was all about me, right, at the beginning. I enter into corporate America, and I start going at it. And I'm surrounded in a world that is male-dominated in the automotive business. The majority are white males, right? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, there's no one there that looks like me. And I don't know who to turn to. And it's funny, because I go through a lot of stumbling blocks, and <clears throat> I you know, eventually find some mentors to try to help me. But at the end of the day, I started, my mind started switching from the me to the we mentality. How do I get more Latino representation you know, at General Motors? How do I get more people that look like me? How do we market to people like me? And just seeing that diversity, it just really I, it, it like instilled in me a passion to want to make a difference at that point in my life. And it took me a few years, obviously, to get to the point where you could have that impact. But it was so noticeable. I was fortunate enough to grow up in a community that really didn't see color. It was a little town in Adrian, Michigan. And there was a lot of Hispanic populations. I went to a small school, so everybody was treated the same. But when I got to corporate America, it kind of smacked me, if you will. All of a sudden, I was different. I was a woman. I was a Latina. And I didn't know, you know corporate behavior, if you will. Even know how to dress, how to speak, how to do all the things like to have my voice. And I thought and self-reflected of everything that I went through personally. And that's when I started to say, I need to go from me to we, and my, and try to help my community. So I guess it started fairly young, but it took me a few years to get there because I didn't realize it, you know? Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I just have to first say thank you for all of you for supporting Hasea, yes. for being here to have this conversation. I want to thank Sid Wilson, of course, and Sylvia for inviting us and have this great conversation with my good old friend, Alma. <laughs> and um, I want to say that all of you have already begun your legacy, right? For me, you know, I looked at my personal legacy, right? Everybody wants to be a great dad or a great partner or a great husband. And you look long range. And professionally, you've already started your legacy too. Whether you're an entrepreneur, or you're a professional, or you're a business person, you want to be uh, an inventor. So you've, you've positioned that as well. And it's only after, you know, as my career spanning 45 years, uh, starting out as a package unloader at UPS at 16, do you get the maturity and your vision starts expanding to what you can do beyond yourself, you know, beyond your family, and beyond your profession. And that's where I believe all of you, we have that in common, that that's why you're here. And, and I, you know, I think Alma and I, after a lot of discussions with Sylvia, I think what we want to have is this conversation with you on how we can inspire each other to continue to be part of something bigger than ourselves, bigger than our company, bigger than our individual 
inspiration. And, and that's, that's how it was for me. It was a question of just, you know, setting short-term goals, long-term goals, getting a bigger platform, and then getting to a position where, you know, in working with Sid and other organizations that we can, working together, really move the world forward and, and, and you know, in a variety of different areas. Uh, can I supplement that? Because <clears throat> one thing I want to say, and oh my God, you make me look back. I forgot. I totally wanted to thank Sid Wilson <laughs> and the entire Sid organization for everything they do and inviting us here on the stage today. Their leadership is amazing. And, you know, to Eduardo's point, I also want to congratulate all the YHCAers. I don't mm -hmm. think they're here. And I also want to congratulate you for being here. A part, you know, your corporations have sent you to represent and hopefully take things back to your respective communities, right? It's not a one and done. And I think that's one of the things that we have to self-reflect on. You know, Sid and his team does an amazing job of, you know, networking and connecting people and giving you some tools that you can take back to your respective companies to really make a difference and have an impact. I know a lot of times we come to these things and then that's it. We wait for the next session, right? Mm -hmm. But we have to self-reflect and say, what can we do? And I just want to congratulate you, Sid, and this entire organization for everything that you do for this community. And that's one of the main reasons we started that relationship from General Motors with us there. Thank you. So one thank you. Um, you know, you've mentioned the I to we and the narrow to broad. Right, and both of those driven by this uh, awareness of otherness, and you know, and being, is using that awareness and acknowledging the feelings that come with it, but the power that that gave you, the motivation that that gave you, which is something I think we don't talk enough about in this space. Right, that there is a silver lining in this regard, that there is a motivation behind our voice when we choose to speak. So I want to focus in on that, that function, that using your voice, and why that's important when you think of legacy. Um, I'm going to start with you on this one. Okay. I saw this young lady had a question, though, so I want to ask oh. her what her question was before well, she, we... It, oh. I, I, in case it was... <laughs> I didn't see you stand. You have to stay there. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Maira Olila from Limbers. I work with um, strategy for the organization. And there is one important thing that I've, I think been thinking about for a while and I was hoping to pick your brain on it. When you look at legacy, you look at the history of Hispanics in the US and we have been able to make progress through tech revolutions and political challenges and all of that. But it feels like the moment we're in today, um, technologically speaking, is a milestone. It's a big change. And in the past, this has helped, um, this has created a bigger gap between communities like ours and others. Um, how do you see the impact of technology moving forward in this, in this moment where we were able to bring a little bit of the representation, but there is still so much more to do? Um, and what we hear is that that is a much bigger challenge for their humanity as a whole. How does it impact us and our um, responsibility of creating legacy? Yeah. You want me to start? Or Thank you, you for okay. your question. Thank you know, it's, it's interesting because there's always a challenge. All the time. Every single time there's a challenge that we have to overcome. And I think when you look at technology and where we're going, and you look at specifically at the automotive built industry where we're going all electric, and you look at the infrastructure that the country has, and you look at you know, accessibility to these vehicles, how do we charge them, how do we get into the smaller you know, minority communities that maybe don't have access to you know, plugging in their electric or whatever the case may be. But I always see this as an opportunity. And it's incumbent on us to educate not only our community, but build that pipeline where those opportunities exist in the talent pipeline. Right? We need to start talking to our young people and working with organizations to say, hey, technology is the future and where we're going. How do we get there? What are the jobs that are available? And how do we encourage them um, to participate and be part of that movement so that we're ahead of the curveball, if you will? And it's all incumbent on you. We're educated. We understand the gap. We understand the opportunities. What can we do to make a difference? Is it mentoring? Is it encouraging young people to do what they need to do? 
Is it advocating for people in your world that maybe can learn at your respective corporations? Maybe it's time to, you know, I remember folks that had geography degrees at General Motors that ended up becoming vice presidents. How do we encourage people to go into those areas where that opportunity exists? We can do that. We can make a difference. Does that make sense? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tie that in real mm -hmm. fast. So mm -hmm. the, one of the tools to do that is this voice. Absolutely. Right, and so, you know, when, you, when we say educate, when we <clears> say, you know, educate who? What is the main tool we have for that? We have our data and we have ourselves and yeah. ourselves, our authentic leadership, our experiences, our knowledge, there's power in that. Mm -hmm. Eduardo, I didn't want to cut you yeah. off, but please take No, it. no, I, I, I definitely agree. I mean, if you look over time, uh, there's always been forces that estrange us, that divide us, and, and so that's, that's always going to be the case. And, you know, it's, we say that there is no really end point to being a more diverse and inclusive society. It is a constant, a constant challenge that we have to overcome. And that's why you as leaders are so important in continuing this linkage, right, in finding new ways for us to connect and advance our community. Uh, you know, companies are really, at the end of the day, just an amalgamation of people, right? And I think the enlightened CEO of today understands that. And they understand not only that it's about their people, but it's about their communities, their suppliers, and their customers. And so while, you know, we have all of this innovations with AI that you think is, is really subordinating the contributions of one person, I think we've always had those challenges. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we just need to think of what is the, the next uh, in keeping us together and advancing and working with organizations like we said, with, like I said, that keep, keep an eye out for how we can do that. <clears throat> and it's so critical, to your point, back to having the voice. You need to be the person in the room to ask the questions. You need to be the person that maybe gets involved with your employee resource groups. You know, a lot of times I meet Latinos, they don't know another Latino in their organization. Well, they're out there. You know, they may need support, they might need help. You need to advocate for our people as much as other groups advocate for themselves, right? You need to stand up and you need to have that voice. And sometimes it's a little hard because they're like, Oh, you don't want to be the Latino advocating all the time for the other Latino. But you know what? If you don't do it, no one else does. Right. And you need to position yourself and have that voice to be able to do it. You need to be more and do more for our community. You heard it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to add anything before stuff. I take the next no, question? No, I can't <laughs> add anything more to that. <laughs> we have a question over here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jessica Robledo Garcia. I'm a North America Demand and Supply Senior Director for Procter & Gamble. I'd like to give you some context, give you some action that I've taken, and then I'd like to ask um, for your insight on how I broaden and amplify my results. So the context is I've noticed that in and outside of my company culture, there's a bit of a crab in a barrel mentality. Mm. And so for the past three years, I've been beating a drum asking for help. And this year, I'm starting to see results. So some of the actions I took was I got creative when COVID came on financing. Since things were virtual, I had noticed that even within our Hispanic community, we were disenfranchising non-managers. So as more budget became available, I basically said, hey, I'm gonna use this money to go do this to help teach our technicians so they can get promoted into management. And so nobody said anything. They left me alone, I published results, and then after three years, I finally got more money to do more. Uh, the other thing I did was I started going to the African-American leadership group. So my father's African-American, and I started to watch what they do. I integrated myself into the group and started bringing strategy over to the Hispanic group. And I'm noticing that my voice is starting to get stronger and I also took over leadership of our Hispanic team. But as I look at this, I want to do more. And I think where now I don't have an idea and I, I probably can't continue to be scrappy, I need to be a little bit more strategic, is how do I also go outside of the walls of my company? How do I do that? They talk to us about boards, but how do I link this together to just really amplify an overall change in my city, in my state, in the area I'm in? 
No small questions mm -hmm. from this no. group, I'm going to tell you. Well, first of all, congratulations for, for having that vision, taking the initiative, and, and advancing the ball for, for your organization and for your community. You know, I found uh, in, in, my, in my sort of context, um, there are certain business leaders that it comes naturally to them, okay? They want to be engaged. They want to be an executive sponsor. In others, it's all about the bottom line. But that's okay, because I have always felt, and this is well, well documented, that companies or business units that are more diverse, that are more engaged in their community, perform better. They have better employee relations, and, and you can document that. I guarantee you, because I did it at my company. I showed a business unit that had more employee engagement, more volunteer hours, more diversity, outperform other divisions that weren't so engaged. So I think showing the impact is, uh, um, excuse me for this, um, is, is very important. Another point that you raised is building coalitions, okay? And as Sid will tell you, uh, you know, building coalitions with other organizations across a diversity spectrum amplifies your voice. And so I would encourage you continuing to do, to do that. And then, you know, doing tactical things like, I don't know if you have an executive sponsor uh, within your organization that helps support what you're doing, but that is certainly something very, very important. Bringing in leaders like Sylvia and Sid into your organization to talk to, to your leadership about how all of your efforts can be brought to other places within the organization uh, and the impact that that can have on the bottom line. That's just some of my suggestions. Yeah, no, and I, and I would just supplement, and I, feel free to reach out to me after this conference, if you will, but um, being very strategic with the ERGs is very beneficial if you do some cross-collaboration efforts as well. And I'll throw you something out for example. Well, first of all, it's very critical you get executive champions or leaders that are willing to support your endeavor and measure that success and that impact to the business, if you will. Because um, ERGs also help build inclusion in the workplace, if you will. One of the things, and I'll just throw something out as an example. If you look at Mental Health Awareness Month, this is something that impacts every one of our communities, especially from a diverse perspective. Whether you're in the LGBT community and everything that happens there, whether you're a veteran, whether you're a woman, whether you're African American or Hispanic, you could bring a coalition of these ERGs together, have a cross collaborative event so that you can continue to strengthen those bonds and presence and show the impact that you all together can do to move the needle, right? And then you have executive champions to support that and you have people that can tell personal stories about how that impacted them. Because someone that's mentally balanced is gonna have a better experience and better results in the workplace, right? So those are the kinds of things that you need to take from a strategic approach to say, how can we work together to have an impact and bring in those external organizations, to Eduardo's point, that can really help bring that to light, right, and have that external voice. So that's just another example. But you are definitely on the right track, and kudos to you. Okay. Thank you both. Yeah. We have a question here. Yeah, my name is Juan David Munoz. I work for Chevron Corporation. I'm a delivery manager for pretty much technology in uh, pretty much uh, the space of heavy oil. So, I mean, Alma, Ed, uh, pretty much pretty proud of you. I mean, the legacy that you guys have created had helped us pretty much lift up. I mean, all the work you did as a minority in a big corporation, I mean, I really appreciate it. I mean, you, you are pretty much lifting us up right now. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. My question is, uh, we as a culture tend to be I mean, we are great, family gatherings and all that, but in a corporate environment, we are pretty much on our own. We just go like this. <laughs> go, 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 right? Yep. And it's all about us because it's, in a way, it's about survival. It's, I need to do this. This is pretty much how I go. Pretty much that. I re something you said, Alma, resonated with me a lot, is the we. Okay. How can we, starting with the people next door, change that mindset? We are here to care for each other, to work together, to create, as Jessica was describing, something beyond our companies. 
how can we start that? Why would you guys say that we need to do? Because it's not a simple thing. And I'm starting mm -hmm. thinking about this, yeah. and I'm just trying to, <clears throat> to see if there is something beyond basically us communicating internally in our companies, because it's, it's, it's not that simple. Do you guys have any insights, any pointers, yeah. or am First, I too old? <laughs> <laughs> no, and it, you know, that's a very, it's apparent in our culture and it's interesting, but we do, we are stronger together, right? You look at the African American com community, they advocate for one another, they come together, and we do that from a family perspective, to your point, we'll do anything for our family, but this person, the Latino that's next or whatever, I'm not, you know, how do I make those connections? You, start, you need to start leveraging your employee resource groups to create those environments and that networking, and you'll be astounded how much you can offer one another. Now, maybe you start off socially. I mean, I think that's something that we all kind of connect socially, or maybe you start out with a volunteer project where you get a group together and you go help you know, young Latinos in the community, or you do a STEM conference for people aspiring to be an engineer, and then you start connecting and talking and wanting to help one another. But you have to make that connection. And we're so good at it. Uh, uh, from a relationship perspective, Latinos are bar none the best. But we got to do it together and with one another. And sometimes you got to give up that little time with your family to make those connections at work. You need your family at work too, right? You need someone that has your back, that understands what you go through, that understands your commitments to the family. And guess what? They're going to help you because they get that. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, I, I totally agree with all of that. And I, I would only add that, you know, I would move in multiple tracks, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I would look at the infrastructure that you have within the organization, right? ERGs, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, someone in charge of uh, corporate engagement, reputation. Look at those leaders and, and bring your ideas to them. They're going to listen. Why? Because they need your support. They're only going to be successful. And I will tell you from firsthand experience, if you are the ones that are also gathering our Latino community, bridging with the African American community, with the LGBTQ community, mm -hmm. with the Asian Pacific Islander. I mean, people in those roles, they need you, okay? So they'll always give you uh, their ear. And if you're working for an enlightened CEO, because I could never think of a better time for the work that Alma and I do than the last five years, six years, and even beyond that, right? Yeah. Because of the racial reckoning that we had four years ago, right? Right now, companies are more engaged, CEOs more importantly, are more engaged than ever. Uh, so I would look at the infrastructure that you have. I will continue to work with ERGs. I will continue to build bridges with other outside organizations. And when you put all of that together, I guarantee you that you will see continued advancements because now is a very, very important time you know, for our country and, and really in many places around the world. So I'm gonna jump in before we come to, to you over here, this question, but what I hear this um, how, the how question, how do I make those connections, how do I make those bridges, and I wanna bring us to maybe some specifics around levers. So you <coughs> used the term Eduardo infrastructure, and so we heard some of those pieces. Your ERG is part of that, your C-suite leadership, your CEO, your CDO. But uh, you know, in terms of connecting to the external group, the building mm -hmm. bridge piece, both of you really sat in that intersection of your companies, right? The internal change and engagement and the external community engagement. How do these executive leaders align these new ideas, their own positions with some of the external engagements of a company? Well, you can yeah, start. let me take that uh, first. <laughs> um, you're already here, right? So there is someone or some group in your organization that is already engaged with Hasset, probably engaged for many, many, many years. And then that's really, you know, in terms of infrastructure, you're here. There's someone that's really looking out for you and for, for our community already in your company. And, and so I, I would look and spend time with them 
And again, it's a quid pro quo. Uh, they're not doing you any favors. You know, they need you in order to succeed and advance their initiatives. So I, I would look to them uh, right off the bat because you're here. Yeah, and I would supplement a, another, you wanna be strategic in your approach when, when you're engaging with some of the external partners that you want to do so that you align with the vision of whatever the company has in mind. So it, for instance, you quote uh, your corporate giving or your, GM, or your foundation, you say, what are your strategic pillars? What is it that's important to this company, right? Is it like for, is it auto, automotive safety? Is it STEM? Um, and then, looking at those partners and asking them, what partners are you working with? And you might be surprised, there's already a connection that you could supplement and you can work with that leader to say, listen, I have a group of folks that wanna connect and support, we wanna align with this, what else can we do in addition, right? Sometimes you just need to reach out and talk to those people. Don't be afraid to approach people. People are happy to help and want to know that you're trying to make a difference at that respective company. Um, our ERGs from a talent, culture, and market pillar, we're looking at talent. How can we do talent development? You can reach out to executives and say, hey, and they, they don't always have to be Latino. That's the other thing. Yep. Some of your biggest advocates could be the white man or the white woman or the black man or the black woman. They want to help. I want to have a panel discussion to talk about what was your professional journey and bring in all my folks, and all of a sudden you're learning from people and making those network connections and learning about those other external ex organizations that exist, right? That's right. So just hopefully, I just wanted to supplement yeah. that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Right, over here. Well, you may have already answered my question. I'm Indira <laughs> Demarisi from PwC. Um, my first question was, um, how do you balance um, showing yourself as a visionary versus a revolutionary person. Mm. And I think you spoke mm. to making sure that you get executive champions. Yep. But mm. when you reach a, a higher level of management, mm. uh, VP, I'm a director, and you manage a very diverse group of people from all ethnicities, how do you manage um, not being perceived as um, being an inclusive leader, if you show, you know, sort of you kind of gravitate to wanting to advocate for one group versus the other, um, does it always have to be within the framework of an ERG group? I mean, I try to create that lasting impact by becoming <coughs> a coach mm -hmm. and a sponsor. So it's more of a one-on-one -on -one relationship yeah. as opposed to you know, being viewed as the head of the ERG group and, you know, doing, basically showing up as just concentrating my efforts in, in that group. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to ask you if you had any thoughts sure. on that. Well, I will tell you, um, you have to handle that very carefully. Mm. Um, for me, uh, you know, I was really the second chief diversity and inclusion officer for UPS in its 117 year history and the first Latino. And you know you have a workforce of 600,000 people all over the world, and we have over 300 ERGs around the world, um, and so I handled my role very carefully because the last thing that I wanted to uh, show is is that I was favoring any organization over another. That's really the bottom line. So, you know, I, I, the facts speak for themselves in terms of. What does our company look like? Those numbers speak for themselves. What, what group needs to more advancement than others? I had all the facts and all the calculations, so that's that piece. Uh, in terms of making sure that, uh, you know, from a, from a foundation perspective, that various groups are funded equally, again, the numbers speak for, them, for themselves in terms of population numbers and all of that. So I was very careful, and then I would make sure that I would cultivate leaders underneath all of those BRGs, right? And the Latino BRGs, Crecer. Crecer 
you know, I, it has won national awards. It just goes to show about our community, how, how strong our community is. But I would make sure that the leadership, the executive sponsors under those organizations are the ones that really are going to lead that community forward. But, but I will tell you that that's an area that was always very sensitive in my mind uh, because I never wanted to, because that's when you lose constituencies, right? That's when you lose credibility uh, within your organization. I couldn't afford to do that, you know, given the, 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 the scope of work. So uh, you just have to handle that very carefully. And I, and I think to your point, the metrics are super critical <clears throat> and it's all about equity right, mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And you need to look at what you're trying to measure and what you're trying to impact. Um, and being fair, you know, if you look at your company's representation of diverse talent, what are the numbers telling you and where does there need to be more support if you're not at a benchmark level? So if your Hispanic population's only at, you know, say 5% and it should be at 10, and maybe your African Americans at 15% and your Asian communities at you know, 12%, you're justified in advocating to get more help in that area, right? So to Ed's point, having the metrics of what you're trying to measure, you know, how many people have been promoted, what is our representation, how many dollars are we giving and donating to the different constituencies you can create your sto own stories to support the initiatives that you're trying to enact upon. Um, the other thing that we've done at DM, which has been very um, powerful, is we actually have all our functions have DEI committees. And these are above and beyond our ERGs. So these are other folks that are very interested in driving those initiatives that are important to them. So it's another way um, to expand beyond the ERGs and engage other folks to, you know, do what you're trying to do as far as moving the needle at your respective companies. This will be our last question. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Nick Orozco, Kaiser Permanente. Um, I'll just say this just to the room because this conversation of how do we go outside of our organizations, I'm leading, I, I'm coming into one of the leads for my BRG in, in Kaiser and um, I just love the thought of going outside and I don't know, I'm learning uh, about what our organization does at those levels, at those higher levels. Yeah. But I'll make this entreaty to the room that if you're in part of a BRG and you're interested in that, I'd love to get your name because from our perspective, we <coughs> recognize the discussion of social drivers or social determinants of health mm -hmm. and how all of this is so related to the longevity and the health conditions in our communities. Yes. And if I can, working in employee benefits, if I can connect that strategy with other organizations and how it will not only impact all of those areas and community health, I think that we can get a more, more buy-in even from our leadership. So with that, I'll just put that out to the room. But one of the things that I think of is that this discussion is probably one of the discussions that is uh, out of everything that we've talked about over these these two days that extends beyond corporation, that extends into our communities and our families, the perspectives, <clears throat> um, even with my kids and how I'm raising them. So I want to ask if you had time in your careers, and Alma, I know coming here in July, you know, uh, but if, if you had more time, is there something that you say, man, I wish I could have put more time into this, or you say, I didn't have a chance to get to this. What would those things be that maybe we could say, oh, I need to make sure that I put that at the front of the charge? Oh, wow. Because I've, uh, <laughs> I'm one of those people that I kind of just stick my finger into everything. Um, and everything I wanted to do, I just do it. And uh, to your point, maybe I don't give a lot of time to certain things, but you know, I think I would have done even more from the community at the grassroots level um, and been exposed more to my community to understand those needs. You know, I kind of found out about everything later. I grew up, you know, like I said, very humbly, um, but I didn't understand all the different pockets around the country. And I didn't understand the lack of education that we had. I didn't understand the lack of support <clears throat> that we had. 
So if I could go back more and kind of connect from a grassroots level, even in your own communities, I mean, there's national organizations like ASER, Unidos, UWAS, LULAC, that do a lot for the overall community. But even in your respective hometowns, sometimes you don't understand what's going on there and the impact that you can have by just lending a helping hand, giving words of advice, or creating a constituents of people that could go and help someone. So I think I would probably do that even more if I could. Eduardo, do you have anything quick to add? Because we are quick. out of time. I'm sorry. Oh, I, never, I, I, never, I always need more time. But anyway, <laughs> two things. Number one, your former CEO that passed away early about six years ago at Kaiser Permanente knew him very, very well. An incredible person with the community. So I know Kaiser Permanente. He has a tremendous legacy of engagement. Uh, for myself, time. Time. The world is a big place, <laughs> and I wish that I, I had more time to continue on my role. But you know, family calls, and you're only given, you're only gifted so much, so many days on this beautiful earth. So, uh, but if anything, I would have liked to have had more time. Wonderful. Thank you. So I told you this is not enough time. I told you it was going to be passionate. I want to thank both Alma and Eduardo for sharing your perspective, your experiences. You know, I hope that you can walk away with some thoughts to, you know, things that resonated with me is one is that the, your leaders who work in DE&I, who work in any line of business, frankly, they actually need you. And so that when you're going to them and sharing an idea, you're helping them. They're, they're, so instead of approaching those meetings as they're doing, I, you know, I'm asking for a favor. I'm, can I get five minutes of your time? Remember that that five minutes is as valuable, if not more valuable, to their strategy, to their understanding of the company, to their understanding of your experience, that, as it is to you. And I think that's, you know, coming in as an equal is really a, a framework that I heard you really start strong with. The other idea is balancing that visionary and revolutionary role. You know, and I would offer to say it, there's probably an and in there. You can be visionary and, mm -hmm. right? So figuring out that sweet spot in your corporate company and your culture within your leadership suite network would be the strategic approach <coughs> to take, the insights there. And of course, the importance of building bridges, right, within our own community and externally. You know, you also are an ally. And that, and when you show up as a leader in allyship for others, they will show up for you. All right. So, and with that, you know, I thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. And we'll no, move on to the next you, session. Man. Thank you. Thank you.